Welcome to our presentation on esophageal stent placement. My name is Lauren Johnson and I'm a PGY3 general surgery resident at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in Little Rock, Arkansas. We'll start by reviewing the indications for stent placement and criteria for patient selection. Esophageal stents are first-line therapy for palliation of dysphagia in patients who are not candidates for other therapy modalities, whether that be due to their medical comorbidities or due to tumor characteristics that classify the lesion as unresectable. Stenting is also indicated in patients with recurrent disease after completion of primary treatment with chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. Stents are also used in the treatment of malignant tracheoesophageal fistulas, as well as for nutritional support during neoadjuvant therapy. The use of esophageal stents in benign conditions has been steadily increasing, as much as 50% in the last decade, according to one source. Indications for use include patients with esophageal perforations that are otherwise surgically unfit, patients with an astomotic leak after esophagectomy, and in patients with refractory benign esophageal structures. In addition, there are also several important contraindications for stent placement. Absolute contraindications include close proximity of the lesion to the upper esophageal sphincter as this will provide an inadequate landing zone for the stent. Others include presence of a tracheal stent and perforation measurement greater than 50% of the circumference of the esophagus or greater than 5 centimeters in length. Relative contraindications to stent placement include hemodynamically unstable patients as well as those with unresolved coagulopathy. Proximity of the lesion to the gastroesophageal junction is also a relative contraindication due to the risk of stent migration or stent placement in the stomach. We will now review the different types of stents as well as some of the advantages and disadvantages of their use. We will begin with self-expanding metal stents, which are most often made of nitinol, an alloy of nickel and titanium. This material provides super elasticity and shape memory, expands at body temperature to fit the morphology of the lesion, and is also resistant to corrosion and hypoallergenic. These stents most commonly come in two different types, namely uncovered and fully covered. Uncovered stents facilitate better embedding and anchoring of the stent, but can be difficult to remove and have a high risk of dysphagia symptoms due to tumor and growth. The fully covered stents allow for easy removal, but have a higher risk of migration. Some examples of currently available metal stents include the Wallflex by Boston Scientific and Alamax ES by Merit Medical. The other most commonly used products are self-expanding plastic stents. These are most often made of a dual-layer polyester mesh externally with an embedded silicone layer internally. Advantages to these stents are that they are easily retrieved endoscopically, but they have a higher migration rate and are technically more difficult to place. An example of an available plastic stent is a Polyflex product by Boston Scientific. We will now discuss the procedure steps for placement. As always, a thorough history and physical examination should be obtained. Upon obtaining informed consent, we recommend counseling patients about the possibility of post-procedure chest discomfort, which is due to the expansion of the stent for up to 72 hours post-deployment. In preparing the operating room for the procedure, we recommend the following supplies be available. First, we recommend placement under fluoroscopic guidance, and so a fluoroscopy-compatible bed, as well as C-arm capabilities, must be ensured. A standard EGD scope and endoscopic tower are needed, and we recommend an easily accessible pediatric scope in the case of a large intraluminal lesion that is unable to be passed with the standard scope. We recommend carbon dioxide insufflation, as this is more readily absorbed by the GI tract mucosa and is associated with less post-procedure pain. As always with the implantation of a device, the IFU card provided with the stent should be carefully examined so as to ensure proper usage and indications. We recommend general anesthesia for this procedure as this facilitates easier placement, protects the airway from possible aspiration, and allows for concurrent bronchoscopy if needed. We recommend the patient be positioned supine with the arms tucked to the side to allow for C-arm movement. The procedure should begin with a diagnostic EGD, noting the size of the lesion, diameter, and location in the esophagus. Radiopaque markers are then used to note the gastroesophageal junction, the site of the perforation or lesion, and two centimeters distal to the lesion to allow for precise stent placement. A spring tip or soft tip guide wire is then placed endoscopically in position distal to the lesion. Choice of stent is guided by the internal diameter and length and should be slightly larger than the lesion to provide adequate radial force. The stent should overlap the lesion by 2 cm proximally and distally. The EGD scope is then withdrawn and the stent deployment apparatus is placed over the guide wire. Proper placement is confirmed with fluoroscopy and the stent is deployed directly under fluoroscopic guidance. 
We recommend avoidance of reinstrumentation after deployment, for example, placing of nasogastric or postpyloric feeding tubes, as there is a risk of placement of the tube between the stent wall and the esophagus, which may dislodge the stent and lead to migration. Pictured here is an example of appropriate patient positioning, as well as placement of paperclip markers for guidance during deployment. Pictured here are examples of stent packaging and the stent deployment devices. The far left photo demonstrates endoscopic and fluoroscopic guided placement of radiopaque markers. In the middle is placement of the spring tip guide wire, and the far right demonstrates a stent after deployment in relation to the radiopaque markers. Thank you for watching our video. A list of references and suggested reading is presented here.